If there was a missing piece of information that is costing you money now, or could cost you money in the future, when would you want to find out about it? Ideally, you would want to learn about it right now. It's best to learn these critical facts before you make any financial decisions, because not knowing could have profound effects on your financial future. One of the best ways to make money is to avoid losing it in the first place. So we focus on all the missing facts to keep your money from falling through the cracks, and we engineer tax strategies to reduce burdens on your income. Welcome to the Roadmap to Retirement podcast with Ken New from Pinnacle Financial Wealth Management. As a fiduciary advisor, Ken focuses on creating individualized holistic plans rather than cookie cutter portfolios. Listen in as Ken and his guest experts explore key retirement and tax strategies that every pre-retiree should consider to reach their pinnacle. Now, on to the show. Welcome to Roadmap to Retirement, the podcast that guides you through the twists and turns of planning for your golden years. I'm Patrice Sikora, and as always, we have your host, Ken New, financial advisor and wealth management expert from Pinnacle Financial Wealth Management. Ken, great to be talking to you again. Thanks, Patrice. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's going to be fun to talk about uh, this important topic, risk tolerance today. Ah, yes. Now today, this topic of risk tolerance, that's what we're going to dissect. And with the recent volatility in the market, it is crucial for our audience of retirees and pre-retirees to understand their unique risk profiles. So, of course, let's start with the basics, right? Ken, what is risk tolerance? Well, that is the classic beginning, really. is uh, So it's an individual's willingness and their ability to handle potential losses uh, and market fluctuations. Uh, so it is critical in determining the appropriate level of risk for any investment portfolio. So think of it as your comfort level with uncertainty and the possibility of financial loss. Ken, financial loss. No, 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 no. That is a phrase, especially the word loss, people do not like. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Uh, so nobody really likes to lose. So, but on the other side of risk, offering some reward. Mm. And that's what people really are looking for. So a good analogy to explain risk versus reward is by using a seesaw. So okay. do you remember in the children's playground, there's that toy that they play on, the seesaw? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And imagine two individuals, one on one side, one on the other side. On one end, you have risk. And on the other side, you have reward. Make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the seesaw represents the relationship between the level of risk and the potential reward in investing. So when you take on more risk, it's like someone sitting on the higher end of the seesaw and maybe all the way on the other end of the board. As a result, there's an opportunity for greater reward or potential gains. However, just like a seesaw, <laughs> as one side goes up, the other side goes down. On the other hand, if you want to reduce risk and prioritize safety, it's like someone sitting closer to the ground on the other end. And maybe they've scooted towards the pendulum or the center. They don't want to go very high in there at all. So this position offers more stability and therefore a lower chance of losses. But it also means the potential for lower returns or mm. lower rewards. The key takeaway is that risk and reward are interconnected, similar to the seesaw. So to achieve higher potential rewards, one must be willing to take on more risk. And conversely, reducing risk often means lower potential rewards. Mm -hmm. So when weighing risk and reward, determining risk tolerance is necessary to ensure that we're working on our client's best interest at all times and they're comfortable and aware of all the possible outcomes. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense, Ken. And I love the analogy between risk and reward. Do you remember the movie, The Big Short? 
Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that film, which is based on a true story, refers to today's topic of risk tolerance because it explores the events leading up to the 2008 financial crisis. We all remember that. Now, this example highlights the importance of understanding risk and maybe having the courage to act on it, even if it goes against the prevailing sentiment. That's a classic. Absolutely. The, the movie tells the story of financial experts who predicted and therefore profited from the 2008 financial crisis. So they betted against the housing market. They identified that the housing bubble and the flawed mortgage-backed securities market is what was fueling this higher market. Mm -hmm. So the film portrayed really the events leading up to the crisis and highlighted the complexity of the financial instruments that were involved. So what it showcases really is that these people saw the risk and the flaws in the system, and they took action, bold action, and tried to capitalize ultimately on the impending collapse. Mm -hmm. So their strategy involve shorting or that's betting against the housing market. Okay, so they bet it against the housing market by purchasing credit default swaps. So essentially their insurance contracts against mortgage-backed securities. So in terms of its relevance to investment strategies today, the big short really offered valuable lessons. It underscored the importance of thorough research and understanding the underlying risks and challenging conventional wisdom. It reminds us that the markets can be flawed and the opportunities arise when others fail to see or acknowledge the risks. However, it's also worth noting that the movie doesn't have a traditional happy ending mm -hmm. in the sense of these fairy tale stories. Well, the main characters successfully predicted the financial crisis and profited from it. The bigger implications of the crisis were devastating for the economy and many individuals. Yes, yes. The film really highlights the human cost of such events. So ultimately, the big short serves as a reminder that investing involves both opportunities and risks. It emphasizes the importance of understanding the underlying dynamics of the market, do research, and maintain a balanced approach to risk management. It is a great movie, Ken, and I highly recommend it to everyone. It does emphasize the significance of risk awareness. But how can someone determine their risk tolerance? Well, there is the key question, risk tolerance. And so one of the ways to gauge risk tolerance is to really take a look and, and, and internalize or reflect back on how do you react typically to past markets particularly during those times of extreme volatility. COVID-19 would be a great example, mm -hmm. the 2008 as well. Uh, did you feel the urge to sell your investments when the market declined, seeking safety? So that is one indication that you may be more conservative. On the other hand, if you viewed the uncertainty as an opportunity, and considered buying, you may have a more aggressive risk tolerance. And if you're somewhere in between, that might indicate moderate. So that's the overview. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Conservative, moderate, aggressive. Yeah. All totally understandable. So let's dive into each one a little bit and see how they actually are defined. So some of these approaches, again, from a general perspective, a conservative or for clients with a conservative risk tolerance and alternative investments can be incorporated hmm. to add some stability, reduce volatility in their portfolios. Some of those strategies include allocating a portion of the portfolio to these alts or alternative investments because they have lower correlations to the traditional markets. An example of that would be the real estate markets. 
real estate investment trusts in particular, or infrastructure funds, or even private debt. They can also consider fixed income alternatives like hedge funds or private credit, which offers potentially higher yields than traditional bonds. And then another example would be to explore really low risk alternative investments, such as market neutral or absolute return strategies, which aim to generate really consistent returns, irrespective of whatever the market conditions are. What about moderate risk? Yeah. So now moving up that risk scale is generally, we'll call it a market or excuse me, a moderate risk tolerance. So clients with moderate risk tolerance seek more balance between risk and potential returns. So some of those strategies would look like allocating a portion to or of that portfolio to alternative investments and have a moderate risk profile, such as a private equity fund or a venture capital fund or diversified commodity investments. Also consider alternative strategies with longer term investment horizon, such as private real estate funds, or again, infrastructure funds. And they offer more potential for capital appreciation and income over time. Mm -hmm. And then the third component I think would be exploring alternative mutual funds or exchange traded funds that provide exposure to a diversified range of alternative investments. And uh, these are such as managed futures or alternative risk strategies. Mm -hmm. All right. Then you got the people who are willing to go out there, the aggressive risk. Yeah. So clients with aggressive risk tolerance may be more open to higher risk alternative investments. Um, They're looking for outsized returns. And uh, so their strategies might be a larger portion to alternative assets with higher growth potential, again, such as private equity, venture capital, or high risk, high reward hedge funds. They can also explore some of the alternative strategies that involve higher leverage or more speculative trading strategies, such as global macro funds or Hmm. distressed debt investing as well. Mm-hmm. And then I'd offer a third component that would be uh, an exposure to emerging markets uh, or really niche sectors, uh, which may offer higher growth prospects, but they do come with increased volatility and risk. It's really important for a financial advisor to carefully look at and assess the client's risk tolerance, their, what their financial goals are what their investment time horizon is. And when recommending alternative investments, work within those alternative investments as a diversification that can help mitigate risks and align with the overall portfolio of risk tolerance. And this requires regularly monitoring and adjusting to ensure that the alternative investments continue to align with the client's changing risk profile and goals. Sounds like a great idea, Ken. But first, how do you determine a client's risk tolerance? Because without that, you really can't create these strategies for them. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And and that is the key. Uh, Determining what a risk tolerance. And a moment ago, I said um, to update them uh, as time moves along. And times change. And so risk tolerance is is a snapshot in time, and it continues to be a snapshot in time. It should be regularly updated. Mm -hmm. Uh, What it gets to, though, is a financial advisor typically is going to use various ways, multiple ways to assess really a client's risk tolerance, but they all get around asking questions and having a conversation and communicating with the client what they're trying to accomplish. And so I'll go over the highlights, the basics of what becomes a starting point for risk tolerance, and then a continuum as time Mm -hmm. moves along. First would be the investment goal. What are the primary investment goals? 
Are you looking to grow your wealth, generate income, or preserve capital? So a quick pause here for a second. Does that change over time? Absolutely, it will change over time. Someone who retires is looking for cash flow and income and maybe to hedge against inflation and those kinds of things. Whereas 10 or 15 years into retirement, that very likely can and will change for many that are in the retirement area. So that goal can change over time and consistently does in my practice. The second to consider though is time horizon. So what is your investment time horizon? Meaning how long do you plan to invest before you need access to the funds? Now here, the underlying presumption is, is that we get an understanding as to the need for access to the principal investment itself. And I would say generally that for clients to think about how long they're going to place the investment in that investment or leave it in that investment. Mm -hmm. In other words, tie their money up. I hear that very often. How long is my money tied up? And what that means is, is the longer we can turn that asset over to an, uh, an, an investment strategy, the higher the capacity for that investment strategy to generate longer term capital gains. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's one of the considerations as well with time horizon. So then comes this keyword that I would use <laughs> and it's called risk capacity. Hey, sorry for the interruption. I know you're listening to the roadmap to retirement podcast and I'm so happy you're here. If you have any questions, please head over to www.pinnaclefinancialwealthmgmt.com or the show notes to find out how to reach us. We would love to hear from you. What is your capacity to take on financial risk? How comfortable are you with potential fluctuations in the value of your investments? That one is a bit more emotional than most all others. <laughs> yes. As you might guess, of course. So when we talk about risk capacity, it, it a, a saying comes to mind. And that is, is that we like the market when it goes up and we don't like it when it goes down. And I'm asked, well, what do you think the market's going to do? And I say, yes. <laughs> and they look at me and say, well, what do you mean? Yes. Is it going up or down? It's going to do both. Yeah. And if our financial strategy is dependent on one or the other, then we have to figure out ways to mitigate that. And that's why each one of the headings began with this idea that an alternative investment would be part of the asset allocation. And for very good reason, because it's not correlated directly with something that we don't control, which is the price action of the market. Okay. So we get into this idea of risk capacity by talking and communicating it out. What does it mean to you? And what does it mean to me? And that's an important interchange with any client is talking about that risk capacity. So, but we continue on with other questions as well. So what is the current financial situation? Mm -hmm. Do you have outstanding debts? or other financial obligations. So that's important because we know that that can be a drag on the financial system or, and so are you relying on investment income for living expenses or do you have other kinds of guaranteed sources of income? Social security being one, or maybe you have a pension uh, and those kinds of things. So the financial situation is going to be a key conversation and integrated with risk tolerance. Then also the knowledge and experience. So a moment ago, we used this fancy term called uh, shorting the market right. in the big short. And it, it's important, I think, as an advisor, when we're determining risk tolerance, that this be an experience of talking to someone about how they feel and what they know and what their biases are, what their thinking is. And in this knowledge and experience heading, 
this is the area where we begin to have a conversation. And it's important as financial advisors, we don't talk over someone's head because we happen to have terms that can be really communicated in more plain English. And so again, how familiar is the client with different investment products and strategies? And we need to explain that to them uh, because for most, they're not 100% sure of what exactly we're talking about. Because how many products are there out there? Lots. How many strategies are out there? More than we can imagine in some cases. So those are a lot of choices there. Now, again, have you invested in the stock market or financial instruments before? Most people will tell me, yep, sure have. I've got a 401k. <laughs> right. I've had it for 30 or 40 years. Okay. And how did you figure out what to invest in? Oh, well, they set that up for us. Or, you know, it's been, and, 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 and it'll be either one. I actively managed it or I didn't. And it's so important that we're able to uh, not just ask the question to check a box, but ask the question for integrity and communication and understanding uh, both ways, by the way. So again, I think that's a good one. When What are the previous experiences? Have you before experienced significant losses? How did you react to that? You know, someone who may have gotten burned in a financial calamity very often is very reluctant to get back into the game. Sure. And, and that's just natural. So again, sometimes that can be uh, a burden or it can be a helping hand as well uh, to, to work with that. So again, great question. Good to get into the, uh, the meaning of uh, what that question would be. Also attitudes toward risk. You know, some people just hear the word risk and it almost, you can tell by the look on their face, they're just, ah, I don't want risk. Right. And, um, and so we have to be able to balance that as we talked about. What is their attitude toward risk? Are they risk adverse for any particular reason? Let's explore that and have that conversation. And then, of course, do they have preferences? Investment preferences are going to be an, an integral part of this conversation. What are you comfortable with? Someone who is comfortable with stocks may not be comfortable with real estate or other alternative investments. Uh, someone who's comfortable with fixed assets like bonds, uh, they might not be as comfortable with a variable equity. And so again, what, and explore that. The scenarios I think are very often uh, important to talk about as well. Mm -hmm. And to actually look at a, a conversation around, oh, you've got a million dollars in your account, so that means that this particular risk profile would have an upside of 22% and a downside of 14% or 12% or whatever the numbers are. And so the client would say, well, yeah, I'm fine with that. And then, you know, the next month, the million dollars shows up at $889,000 <laughs> and the client goes, what happened? happened? Yes. And I would totally get that because you know that kind of a drop is uh, is 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 very significant but I, I bring up that drama because that is exactly what we originally looked at and said oh yeah I'm okay with that cuz the focus was on what the 22% or the 24% oh I'd love to get that then I'd be at a million 240,000 and so so the idea of looking at scenarios and then getting some conversation, and not just a one time, how do you feel about it today, but this is an ongoing conversation. The final piece that I would always add with risk tolerance is how diversified are we? Hmm. Are we diversified across many asset classes as much as we might like the preference real estate as an investment, or even stocks as an investment. As much as we might like that, we want to be very aware of how much we've allocated to any one area. And so, so again, really, really important um, that we understand that diversification is one of the key components to helping mitigate risk. And what I would submit is these kinds of questions and all the ensuing questions that come around it 
are really one of the keys to be able to determine what's suitable as an investment strategy and the kinds of asset allocations that really are going to help the client align with their risk tolerance and ultimately what the long-term goals are. That that really is a lot to consider, Ken, but I'm sure you've got processes in place to determine the appropriate comfort levels, right? Well, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I should think so after 25 the, years, right? The, I, I think... I think one of the things that that really uh, always comes to mind is is that, as you as you mentioned, after 25 years, uh, what we were doing 20 years ago, or whenever if we want to go back and look, uh, <laughs> would be would be a different conversation than it is today. I think what we've learned over time is is that one of the biggest reasons why a client would leave a financial advisor really is not like the the prevailing theory is, is that, well, you lost me a lot of money. So the market was down and I wasn't really happy about that. So I'm going to go on. It's really not that it's up there. That one's up there for sure, but it's not being communicated with yes. not having regular conversations. And I know it seems like I'm flipping this right back on communication again, but it really is the key. Communicating with the client regularly, quarterly, at the bare minimum, semi-annually, but for some clients, you know, one time per year is enough, but very few, a year is a long time frame, especially in today's financial world. Um, so again, that's one of the things that we do much differently today than when I first got into practice. And for uh, any financial advisor, I think we would all resonate around the same thing. And that is, is always being in touch with our clients. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you over time, you work with all kinds of clients, some that are very, very conservative, who would say to you, I don't want anything but bank CDs. And of course, when bank CDs were paying 2%, they right. were, we were able to move off of that a little bit. Um, so, but, 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 but the point is on the other side, when we get out on the other side, they got those extremely aggressive people and to help them to understand that maybe a portion of the portfolio can be dedicated to that, what we call a moonshot to our, you know, this idea that we're going to have this 10 X kind of return. And then there's all those that are in between. And that represents the vast majority of people. And over time, their comfort with risk is the most important factor. And what that gets down to is people who are not going to be comfortable with losing values should not be exposed to those kinds of things that regularly will fluctuate. Mm -hmm. So we're always considering the balance between the investment objectives, their time horizons, and everything in between. You elaborate on that a little bit, Ken, a little bit more. Sure, sure. So one of the crucial factors is determining uh, that w when we determine this risk is to take a look at time horizon. And I intimated on that a moment ago. And when we're thinking about the time horizon and we say, well, I'm going to be able to have this this part of the portfolio, I'm going to turn it over to this investment and it's going to be in that investment for uh, a longer period of time. It gives us more opportunity for higher upside potential. Uh, we're always looking to get it paid along the way. We're always looking for those monthly distributions, dividends, whether paid monthly or quarterly, but we also open ourselves up to a bit more of the upside potential. That type of money then, is not going to be the money that we need in the next six months or a year or two years. So there's this balance between how long our principal is going to be exposed to the investment and how soon we need to get to some of the cash flow mm -hmm. uh, or some of that cash that's in that investment. Ken, so it turns out it's a combination of factors that determine the appropriate risk level, but are there some other factors that you also consider? Absolutely, Patrice. So we want to include our current 
and our anticipated income. We want to take a look at the client's age and again, that risk capacity. Um, so we just go another layer into this conversation. And again, risk capacity refers to the ability to take on financial risk without jeopardizing your financial well-being. So one of those determinations is a little deeper in understanding of what financial well-being is. And it's important to assess all these factors and look at them comprehensively to determine the type of risk that the client is willing and able to take at that moment. Ken, you have so much informative material here on risk tolerance. Uh, we're going to break this into two parts. This has been a wonderful, rich part one. And in part two, again, we're going to look at risk tolerance. Tell us more about what you have on the agenda. Yeah, so next week when we get together, really take a deeper dive into what are these questions centered around and how deep do we get to determine what kind of portfolios uh, would be appropriate? What are these investment vehicles? And then actually start to consider investment vehicles for different age groups, risk capacities. Uh, so again, next week, deeper dive, get down to some of the nuts and bolts of making risk tolerance make sense in someone's financial future. All right. And to listeners, thank you for tuning into the Roadmap to Retirement with Ken New from Pinnacle Financial Wealth Management. Remember, part two coming your way. It's going to have a lot of wonderful information. And remember, planning for retirement is a journey, not just a number. And we're here to help you navigate the road ahead. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for listening to the Roadmap to Retirement podcast. Click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available. Visit our website at www.pinnaclefinancialwealthmgmt.com or give us a call at 321-454-3623. Securities offered through Center Street Securities, Inc., CSS, a registered broker-dealer and member of FINRA and SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Center Street Securities Advisors, CSA, a SEC-registered investment advisor. Pinnacle Financial Wealth Management, CSS, and CSA are independent entities. Discussions are meant to be general in nature and may not be suitable for all investors. Please consult a tax professional regarding any tax implications.